What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football Channel. As always, it's your boy Nick, back with another Team Outlook. We start up the AFC today. We're gonna start in the AFC East. And we'll get the Bills out of the way first because we know there's a lot of firepower in New England we wanna talk about, a lot of upside in Miami. I guess I should probably get the Jets out of the way first, but we're gonna go with Buffalo because I don't know why. Make sure if you've enjoyed these team outlooks, go give it that thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, what's going on, subscribe if you dig the video. Also wanna say, if you need any gear for your league, Fantasy Jocks has you covered. They do draft boards, championship belts, rings, the highest quality, I can guarantee you that. I have my affiliate link down below. You can use the promo code TACOCORP through my affiliate link and you'll get 10% off. Yes, TACO, C-O-R-P, CORP. Let's get into the numbers. All right, starting off with Ty God Taylor. Ty God. The level of disrespect that Ty God has received in Buffalo is out of control. I love Tyrod going into last year. He was one of my top three sleepers at quarterback. He is again this year because he's always been consistent on the field and for fantasy purposes. Since he's taken over in 2015, they've been a top 12 scoring offense in Buffalo. It's not a team that you think of, you know, scoring wise when you think of the Bills but they've been that since he took over. And he's been even better in fantasy. In 2015, he ranked third among all quarterbacks in fantasy points per drop back with .58. Last year, he was top six, so he's consistently in that top six range. As long as he gets enough volume, he's gonna be efficient. And he's done this all without Sammy Watkins there consistently, so he's had no weapons on the outside to work with. Of course, the biggest concern here is the fact that he doesn't get enough volume, right? They're the second heaviest run team in the NFL behind Dallas. But I think what he lacks in the passing volume, he obviously makes up for with his legs. So over the last two years, since he took over in 2015, he's averaged 40 rushing yards per game, right? That's an extra four points. So he gives you a floor there, right? As a rushing quarterback that almost no other quarterback in the league can give you. Now you have this new offensive coordinator, Rick Dennison, coming in, and he uses a lot of bootleg, uh, like rollout kind of system when, he, when he's passing the ball which I think is great for Tyrod Taylor's rushing upside, right? When you get him out of the pocket, he's able to escape pressure. He's able to see the field more. He's definitely going to have higher rushing attempts. He's already led the league in rushing yards last year. So I think implementing this new kind of bootleg style of offense is only going to help him in the long run. What I also like about that style of offense, right? You had Mike Gillisley come in last year and vulture a lot of touchdowns, especially on the goal line, right? Really good down there. You have a good offensive line for Tyrod Taylor. You implement the bootleg kind of plays near the goal line. If you get Tyrod Taylor scrambling to the outsides, right, right near the goal line, I can guarantee you he's going to score a lot of touchdowns down there. Anytime you can get a quarterback on their own, you know, just someone that's shaky, someone that's nifty, he'll find a way to get in. So right now, Taylor's going at quarterback 16, 123rd overall. It's like the same story as last year, and I don't get it because he always puts up on a points per game basis, he's always a top 10 quarterback in fantasy. As, as a rushing quarterback, obviously, you know, there's a little bit of injury risk, but he's pretty, he's been pretty good over the last couple of years in terms of staying on the field. So I think he's an absolute steal where he's going to draft. I'm sure he's gonna be on a lot of my teams. So when you're looking at his weapons, you, you obviously need to start with Sammy Watkins here. It's pretty much where the list begins and ends. Actually, I, I mean, after drafting Zay Jones, it doesn't, but you have Sammy Watkins here. Ridiculous talent out of Clemson has not been able to stay on the field. The best sample size we have from him is 2014 and 2015, where he played 29 games. He averaged 70 receiving yards and .51 touchdowns per game. It's pretty good. So we prorate that out to a full 16 games. That would have made him fantasy wide receiver 10 last year and fantasy wide receiver 15 in 2015. Last year was a down year for wide receivers overall. Um, so that's why he was ranked a little higher. That's in standard leagues, by the way, standard scoring, um, which is probably an upgrade for him. Obviously he's not as good in PPR because he catches a lot of long balls. He'll go like five for 90 with a touchdown, things like that. So that that's like when you prorate out the, the full seasons that he's had with Tyrod Taylor. I mean, me last year, he kind of screwed me last year. I picked him in, in the third-ish round in a lot of my leagues. So he burned me and I'm not sure I want to deal with that again. Right now he's being picked 30th overall, wide receiver 15. Basically the exact same spot you had to draft him last year as you do this year. So the fact that he missed all of last year with an injury after being an injury risk going into the year, people are not even factoring that into his ADP. So for me, I'm not gonna be picking Watkins with my third round pick. If he slips a little later into the fourth, I would definitely consider it maybe 35 to 40 in that range. 
but I think this year I'm kind of staying away from that group of middling wide receivers who have a lot of talent but are injury prone, you know, like the Watkins, uh, Heenan Allens, even like the Alshon Jeffries. That middling zone is like very confusing this year to navigate, and I'm probably going to be staying away from a lot of those guys. The upside is obviously there. I mean, Watkins can break out and give you a top five wide receiver for the price of wide receiver 10 to 15, but I'm just not with that this year. So we have Robert Woods, who was serving as their number one wide receiver last year with Watkins out, moving to the Rams, and they drafted this kid, Zay Jones. He'll play the second receiver spot uh, across from Watkins. They actually traded up on draft day to the 37th pick to pick this kid, so they they absolutely love him, and I do too for fantasy purposes and as a real-life receiver. I think he's going to help Sammy Watkins out a lot. So Jones had crazy numbers at college. He had like 400 catches, over 4,200 yards, so like 23 touchdowns, I think it was. He's 6'2", uh, a little over 200 pounds, so really good size. So he broke the FBS single season and receptions record with 158 catches as a senior. He dropped just six of 164 catchable targets. Think about that. He had 164 catchable targets. He caught 158 of them. Incredible hands. Tested out really well. 94th was it? Yeah, 94th percentile on the spark score. Really intriguing young talent. This dude Zay, he lived on like quick hitters, screens. That's stuff that gives you immediate value in PPR leagues, right? Because you might catch five to six balls a game, even as a rookie, because they're going to utilize his skill set in that offense. There's no one else here as, as a weapon on the outside, right? With Robert Woods gone, he is the number two. He's going at pick 155 to 160 in that range right now. So there's, I think there's good value there for Zay Jones. And it wouldn't surprise me if he was like in the top five in receptions for rookies this year, just given the opportunity there. Definitely someone to look out for in uh, Dynasty, Keeper Leagues, things like that. I mean, behind him, they have a mix of Philly Brown, Corey Brown, Andre Holmes, just a bunch of like free agents that they picked up this offseason. No one that I'm even slightly interested in fantasy uh, relevance. All right, so I'm just going to straight up read the paragraph that I wrote about Charles Clay in my blog post. He led the Bills in receptions last year with 53, but he was just Tight end 16 fantasy among 34 qualified tight ends that had at least 50% of the team's snaps. Clay ranked 21st in fantasy points per opportunity, 23rd in yards per target, 27th in yards per reception. He only scored four times on 81 targets. <clears throat> he tied all tight ends with seven drops, so he led the, the position with drops. Uh, he's a mediocre talent in a run-heavy offense. So to me, he's nothing more than a middle to low tight end two for 2017. So I'm going to be passing on Charles Clay everywhere. I know he glimpses that talent. You know, he has somewhat games every now and then. You're like, oh, maybe I can utilize Clay. I guarantee you, if you pick him up after a good game, he'll have three bad games in a row. That's just how he operates. Coming from, you could tell I've been burned by Clay a few times. The only real weapon we need to get to is Shady. Shoot it. So, Sean McCoy. It's an absolute dynamite year last year for Buffalo. Uh, right now he's going around the 10th pick. So a first round pick, well deserved. He's in that second tier behind David Johnson, Le'Veon Bell. Depending on what happens with Zeke, he might be right up there with Zeke and the suspensions. First order of business, we'll talk about the new offensive coordinator, Rick Dennison. He does a, a zone scheme for running, which he learned under Mike Shanahan and Gary Kubiak, but we saw last year Anthony Lynn and Greg Roman did a lot of uh, they had they had a lot of runs like a zone scheme run so there's not supposed to be any real change in in what's going on there they have a good run blocking line Shady looked very good last year average a career high 5.4 yards per carry he added 50 catches uh, was just stupid efficient on the amount of touches that he got let me read this off so despite ranking 17th in carries per game. And 20th in targets per game at his position, he ranked 4th in fantasy points per game. So, he didn't get a ton of opportunity, but he did turn that into crazy production. Something that McCoy's kind of always done in his career. He's one of those guys, he's so shifty that he makes guys misses. He can make opportunity out of nothing. And you're seeing that a lot with Buffalo. And again, I think this goes back to Tyrod being a running quarterback. We see this a lot in the NFL. You see success by a running back, especially when the quarterback is a running quarterback quarterback because you know he opens up a lot of holes linebackers and and secondary guys need to kind of focus on both guys because they don't know where the play is going to go is it going to be run by the quarterback is it going to be run by the running back is it going to be a pass play so that opens holes up a lot and i think that definitely benefited mccoy and i think he's going to be doing a lot of the same this year what was interesting is that he like i said he averaged seven or he ranked 17th in carries per game despite the bills actually tying dallas for the most rushing attempts per game with just under 31 
So you'd think that since they run the ball so much, he would be up there in carries per game, but he was tied for for 17th, which is kind of crazy. And it's because we had uh, Gillisley there last year, of course, Tyrod Taylor, uh, even Reggie Bush and Jonathan Williams combined for 235 carries. Another big story, obviously, from last year was the fact that Mike Gillisley vultured a ton of touchdowns. If you were a McCoy owner, you knew all about that. What I would say is Gillisley was like stupid efficient inside the five yard line. He was six for six on rushes inside the five yard line, turned all of them into touchdowns. McCoy did outrush him inside the five, he outrushed him inside the 10 and the red zone. So it's not like they gave gave away all of his opportunity. McGillisley just happened to be so good in the limited carries that he had. So I'm not predicting that carry over to Jonathan Williams or anything like that. Do I actually think McCoy has touchdown upside here, especially with Gillisley now gone. Their offensive line was really good in terms of like yards for contact. Like they, McCoy didn't get touched that much behind the line. They were one of the best offenses in terms of that. So once you get Shady in the secondary, he's almost impossible to, to tackle. So then you have Jonathan Williams, who's supposed to serve as his backup, right? He's like six foot, 220, 225, a perfect size to replace Gillisley, around the same size. So you would think that he kind of steps into that role. Gillisley was super valuable because he was so efficient on his limited touches. You would assume that Jonathan Williams not going to just jump right in and go six for six on these touchdowns. I would say he's definitely less valuable than Gillisley was last year, but they do run a ton. He's a good handcuff to McCoy. Um, and he should see some opportunity, whether it's the goal line, whether it's just early down work. So I don't hate Williams as a backup. I just definitely don't think you should value him where we saw the production come from Gillisley last year. So that's kind of going to uh, wrap up the Bills outlook for me. If you enjoyed the video, please give it that thumbs up. So here's a question to wrap up the video. Would you rather have 0.5 PPR? Watkins, Keenan Allen, Alshon Jeffrey. Yeah, out of those three, who are you taking? I'm having a tough time. I think Allen would be last there for me. I think I would take... Watkins, Jeffrey Allen. But let me know. Comment down below and I'll see y'all next time.